Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending today. Welcome to our webinar today. Um, this is the second of a, a series of three webinars across three days, um, including talks by local experts um, alongside presentations by members of the Crossref team. Um, yesterday, we heard from Dr. Lukman, um, who talked about the future of in, uh, Indonesian journal policy. And we had a talk by Crossref um, providing a bit of an introduction um, about the work that Crossref does for the benefit of the scholarly community. Today, uh, we are joined by Dr. Desbata Erwin Irawan from the Open Science Community Indonesia, um, who will first talk about the urgency um, of accurate, comprehensive metadata, followed by a talk by myself and Amanda Bartel about how to register your content at Crossref. On our final day tomorrow, we'll be joined by Dr. Mohamed Sayarif Bando, who is the head of the Indonesian National Library, who will talk about the OneSearch platform and upcoming projects of the Indonesian National Library. Again, with a presentation by Crossref staff, um, this one will be about the uses and value of Crossref MESS data. So we hope you find today's session interesting and useful. Um, we will make sure that presentations um, and recordings are made available to you after today. So you can watch this in your own time and for anyone who can't join us today. Um, please do feel free to ask questions during the presentations. You can type these into the Q&A box and we will either get back to you um, over the Q&A or we will save these questions to answer for the discussion section. We'd also really like to thank Relawan Journal for collaborating with us on this webinar series. Um, thanks to all of our guest speakers and also to our Indonesian Crossref Ambassador team for helping us to put all of this together. So I'm now going to hand over to Miss um, Lydia, who's going to be our moderator for today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to her to give the introductions for our first speaker. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning for those who are in the UK. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, for today's events, we will have mixed language for the first presentation. will be delivered by Pak Dasapta Erwin Irawan. Uh, he's from Institute Technology Bandung, and also he is the founder of Rain Archive. And he is here to present Open Science Community atau Komunitas Sains Terbuka. Bapak Ibu yang sudah hadir hari ini, uh, untuk presentasi pertama yang akan disampaikan oleh Pak Dasapta, kita akan menggunakan bahasa Indonesia. Uh, dan for those who are coming from outside Indonesia, you can still follow the presentation because the slides, I believe, is already in English. And if you have any question, you can just drop in a Q&A chat box. So we have Q&A part there. Please uh, drop your question there. And if you want to uh, directly ask, you can raise your hand. And if we still have time, because it's about 45 minutes that we have for discussion, Later, uh, it will follow by a presentation from Crossref staff. Jadi setelah Pak Dasapta nanti sesinya ada sesi dari uh, Crossref staff yang akan menjelaskan DOI atau Digital Object Identifier. Terus kemudian uh, metadata, terutama yang ada di Crossref. Dan kemudian bagaimana mengkoreksi jika metadata itu kemudian salah. Uh, dan konten kalau misalnya ada perubahan di publisher dan sebagainya, maka teman-teman dari Crossref akan mengcover penjelasan tersebut setelah pada sabta uh, presentasi. Oke, okay. uh, tadi sepertinya sudah saya perkenalkan Pak Dasapta ya, baik uh, kita panggil saja Pak Dasapta sudah ada di dalam room, silakan. Uh, sudah Mbak Diana, tapi ini saya belum bisa stop video. Oh, it's okay, Pak. Uh, bisa dicoba share screen mungkin? Okay, no video. So no need to see my face. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone here, I think I already know. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, basically uh, 30 menit untuk presentasi Bapak uh, it's about 30 minutes for presentations but if you yeah. need more it's okay because uh, teman-teman dari Crossef akan mulai presentasi jam 3. Jadi yeah. sekitar uh, 1 jam ke depan ini adalah uh, waktu kita untuk mendiskusikan uh, metadata dari sis, dari uh, sudut pandang uh, open science community kepada Pak Desapta saya persilakan. Baik. Uh, Mbak Diana, sebelum saya mulai, apakah ada partisipan yang selain uh, narasumber ya, yang berasal dari negara lain? Uh, kalau lihat dari nama-namanya ini, most of them are come from Indonesia. But we have atten- uh, attendance from outside Indonesia. Yeah, it it should be, but um, I believe that most of the names here. Uh, I couldn't find any Western name except for Vanessa and Amanda. Uh, yang lainnya ini semuanya nama lokal, Pak. Ya, sip. Thank you. So, okay. Selamat uh, siang, so, selamat sore, uh, Ibu dan Bapak sekalian, serta selamat pagi untuk rekan-rekan dari Crossref. Yeah. Uh, good morning to our colleague from Crossref and Good afternoon to our uh, colleague and attendants coming from Indonesia region. Uh, thank you for having me uh, to present my thoughts in this uh, event. Yeah. Jadi terima kasih untuk RCI Crossref sudah memberikan waktu dan kesempatan bagi saya untuk mempresentasikan uh, apa yang saya pikirkan. Nah, karena ini adalah apa yang saya pikirkan hari ini tidak ada slide. Jadi today we're not going to I'm not going to tell you about my slides but I'm going to tell you about my thoughts. So no slides for today. So I'm begin begin my 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 thoughts with this view, right? So we have this uh, Sinta platform. Jadi di depan kita ini ada Sinta platform sudah dibuat oleh Ristek Dikti sejak mungkin enggak tahu saya 5 tahun yang lalu mungkin Ya, mungkin lebih ya. Um, this platform is meant to to register um, the staff, lecturers and researchers in Indonesia and also their work ya. Jadi untuk meregister staff um, uh, peneliti dan dosen yang ada di Indonesia dan karya-karya yang mereka hasilkan. Nah, jadi ini adalah platform kita. Nah, yang sudah dijelaskan oleh Pak Lukman kemarin. Jadi Ibu dan Bapak di sini yang sudah masuk ke dalam sistem Sinta ini sangat beruntung. Kenapa? Karena tidak tidak semua negara yang ada di blok selatan ya, yang sedang berkembang punya sistem seperti ini. So uh, we are fortunate to have this uh, system because not many uh, countries in in the developing regions that have uh, similar platform ya jadi kita harus itu itu yang pertama nah hanya saja sekarang begini yang jadi masalah adalah bahwa selama ini kita mementingkan ini gitu ya jadi kita fokus ke sini ya jadi uh, if you uh, if you uh, if you remember the talk that we have we had yesterday with Pak Lukman Sinta akreditasi indeksasi itu adalah menjadi tujuan ya jadi uh, Sinta indexing and then indexed by Scopus web of science accredited journals accreditation system itu it becoming becoming the goal of your work not the tools to measure your your governance jadi itu semua untuk dijadikan sebagai tujuan target ya target. Nah, itu menurut saya salah gitu ya. Jadi target Ibu dan Bapak itu adalah government governance dari jurnal. Jadi the target of journal editors is how to provide good governance in in scientific journal operate operating operation, right? So itu yang yang penting ya. That's the important thing so it's not indexing it's not accreditation it's just tools right? 
so we're uh, coming to this part the metadata ya. jadi metadata i will begin my thoughts with this picture of the original the second generation of ipod ya jadi ini ipod generasi kedua ya karena kalau yang generasi pertama itu pakai tombol yang masih timbul ini generasi kedua sudah soft touch nah kalau ibu dan bapak lihat di sini ya ini bisa saja sama dengan any other mp3 players ya. jadi pasti di layar itu ada uh, ini artis ya Jack Johnson ini artisnya if I had eyes adalah judulnya the title of the song and then slip through the static adalah the name of the album ya. adalah nama album yang uh, lagu ini ada di dalamnya ya. kemudian we have this stars ya it's just for read for listeners ya, to click if they like the song the stars should be six or five and then if they don't like the song the star would can be one or no star at all jadi ini untuk menilai saja rating rating ya. ini adalah metadata ya jadi kalau ibu dan bapak bertanya bagi ibu dan bapak di sini attendance who are not journal editors uh, mungkin metadata itu adalah strange thing ya. jadi metadata adalah uh, barang yang asing tapi untuk ibu dan bapak jurnal editor metadata itu adalah daily stuff ya. metadata is daily stuff for for uh, journal editors or journal manager so uh, metadata itu is everywhere ya. kalau ibu dan bapak pesan GoFood juga sama <laughs> ya jadi kalau ibu dan bapak uh, open your phone ya and then you go to this uh, app and then you start to order uh, food ya, untuk memesan makanan maka ibu dan bapak akan melihat dari sejak uh, apa namanya nama masakan berapa harganya fotonya kemudian uh, ada di restoran mana alamatnya di mana they're all metadata right and then uh, we came to this uh, Uh, section ya metadata terkait dengan publishing jadi metadata that related to publishing uh, workflow so ini adalah layar tampilan dari open preprint system ya ini adalah uh, this is the view of uh, open preprint system it's similar to OGS OGS3 ya mirip dengan OGS3 jadi ini seperti biasa ini uh, submission should start with this one right jadi klik-klik ini semua pernyataan disclaimer itu ada di sini dan guidelines juga ada di sini jadi kemudian di sini ada juga metadata comments for the moderator ya dan seterusnya kemudian sampai juga kita ke sini enter metadata um, oke okay. Oke, okay, I will yeah. Just click all of this. Oke, okay, upload submission. And then metadata. Oke, okay, I will open one of a paper here ya. Yeah. Jadi uh, preprint di sini ini sama dengan um, ordinary general published peer review articles ya. Yeah. Jadi ada judul, kemudian ada penulis, ya. Kemudian di setiap penulis itu ada affiliation, ya. Jadi there's title, authors, and the affiliation of the authors, and then abstract, ya. And so on and so forth. Uh, itu adalah metadata, ya kan? Nah, metadata itu bisa uh, banyak, ya. Jadi metadata itu sudah ada standarnya. Ya, seperti Dublin Core gitu ya. Metadata has standard like Dublin Core one of the standards right? So this metadata itu uh, bisa berkaitan dengan hal-hal yang basic. Ya. Jadi judul, penulis, affiliation ini hal-hal yang basic. Tapi metadata juga bisa diarahkan untuk hal-hal yang sifatnya struktural ya. Metadata is also useful to to understand the structural uh, situation. Yeah. Saya kasih contoh. Saya buka Scopus. Yeah. 
Kemudian kalau saya tulis di sini misalnya hidrogeologi. Ya. Kemudian di right uh, this one is article title research. Ya. Yeah. Maka kita bisa lihat sebenarnya ini itu adalah metadata juga. Ya. Yeah. This is the metadata. This is also the metadata. How the system? Yeah, I'm I'm not a marketer of Scopus, but I I only use Scopus, right? Saya hanya menggunakan Scopus. Saya bukan marketingnya Scopus dan lain-lain. Uh, jadi sistem Scopus itu membaca ini itu dari metadata, ya, yeah, yang yang diterbitkan atau dibuat atau atau disubmit oleh Uh, jurnal editor. Oke. Okay. Nah, kemudian year ini juga sama. Tahun ini adalah tahun terbit. Jadi ketika ibu dan bapak menerbitkan satu artikel, if you publish an article for your journal, maka uh, you have this uh, metadata uh, for publish year. Ya, yeah. jadi ini adalah berkaitan dengan metadata tahun. Pada saat artikel itu terbit. Kemudian ini author name. This is metadata of course. Nah, ini juga metadata. Nah, masalahnya adalah sekarang sebagai author dari sisi author, how much you would focus on these entries. Jadi bagaimana ibu dan bapak sebagai penulis itu fokus dan menganggap entry ini penting, ya sebagai bagian dari identitas artikel ibu dan bapak. So if my background is geology, right, earth and planetary science, I I can go with this option. Jadi saya bisa pilih opsi ini atau saya juga bisa pilih opsi yang lebih detail, more detail option for field of science, ya, yeah, related to my articles. So I can say. Uh, Uh, energi ya jadi ada bagian dari energi yang menjadi bagian dari art science ya misalnya kalau paper saya tentang industri migas maka uh, uh, I would go with energy ya sebagai subtopik dari art science ya mungkin kalau saya berkaitan apa namanya menerbitkan artikel berkaitan dengan computer coding terkait dengan misalnya geological mapping maka mungkin I would go with this option ya computer science. Jadi ini akan mencerminkan bagaimana ilmu yang ibu dan bapak kembangkan ya in the context of the article that you publish menggambarkan interaksi ya. Metadata ini bisa menggambarkan apakah Uh, you are working in monodisciplinary subject or multidisciplinary subject. Multi juga bisa banyak, bisa transdisciplinary, bisa cross-disciplinary. Yeah. So uh, this metadata would go with your identity as a researcher, right? So this is uh, why it's very important to make your metadata com as complete as possible and as detailed as possible as the 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 platform provide you. Right. Kemudian ini jelas metadata, dokumen type ya. Kalau uh, artikel peer review pasti ada di sini ya. Kalau conference paper pasti ada di sini dan seterusnya. Nah, tapi di sini juga menarik ketika ada artikel yang jenisnya review ya dan letter. Nah, uh, in my observation not many journals in Indonesian ecosystem ad adopt this type of articles. Yeah. It's usually original research or, or full research, right? But jarang sekali, uh, very rarely journals in Indonesia adopt this kind of article. Yeah. Setidaknya review dan letter ini sangat jarang. Jadi uh, kalau saya klik ini Indonesia maka kebanyakan adalah pasti artikel nanti kita buktikan ya Mr. Spata ya yeah. apologies would it yeah. be possible to uh, zoom in on your screen a little oh, so, so sorry that people can see a little bit more perfect right. thank you ah, okay sorry <laughs> for that 
Okay, now source title is it's this is metadata where the article is published, and then um, the uh, okay keyword is also important. So uh, I also uh, play my role in this ecosystem as a peer reviewer. Saya juga peer reviewer. Nah, masalahnya adalah seringkali saya mereview artikel yang uh, keywordsnya itu kurang kurang menyentuh begitu ya kurang mengena ya keywords penting import keywords is very important because this is how people would find your articles ya jadi uh, kata kuncinya adalah uh, satu jalan atau pintu cara orang lain untuk menemukan artikel ibu dan bapak gitu jadi uh, keywords ini harus detail Walaupun tidak perlu terlalu detail ya, harus detail, tapi harus mencakup juga setidaknya tiga hal. Satu lokasi ya, karena saya geospasial atau geoscience itu pasti ada lokasi. Jadi kalau bisa ada lokasi, indikasi dari lokasi. Karena karena viewers or potential readers would also there's a chance that they would search your article based on location. Right? Jadi lokasi harus ada. Kemudian methods. Jadi if I go with hydrochemistry method. Geophysical method it should be in your keywords. Ya. Yang yang terakhir yang ketiga terkait dengan problems and solving. Jadi anda mau uh, me, me, menyelesaikan masalah apa? Misalnya artikel dengan flood tentang flooding. If you write an article about floods, so floods must be in your keywords, right? Okay, affiliation ini juga penting. Kenapa? Karena di sinilah Uh, institusi ibu dan bapak ya as as usual we are valued based on our publication right and then our office our our uh, campus our university would count you would count um, how many papers that you publish every year so uh, your leader the university leader would search this affiliation ya yeah, based on affiliation. Ini ini penting. Jadi afiliasi ibu dan bapak itu harus ada ya. Yeah. Setidaknya untuk level fakulti atau fakultas sampai ke level universitas itu harus ada ya. Yeah. Saya juga biasanya tidak memasukkan program studi ya yeah, atau jurusan karena pasti akan terlalu panjang. So usually I would go with faculty name and uh, university name. Nah, ini juga penting. Ini juga penting. Ini sangat penting menurut saya di luar masalah branding yang kemarin disampaikan oleh Pak Lukman. Ya. Jadi di sini adalah satu tools buat negara kita untuk bisa mengukur sejauh mana dana riset yang telah dikeluarkan berhasil menjadi artikel. Jelas ya. Jadi. Uh, metadata funding sponsor yang sering tidak diisi itu sangat penting untuk negara ketika mereka ingin mengukur sejauh mana dana riset yang mereka lakukan sudah menjadi artikel. Ya, yeah, so this metadata is very important for your country as they would measure their their efficiency and their effectiveness of their budgeting system to count if the the research Uh, fund that they send send out and give it to you uh, can has already been transformed into an article. So ini penting funding sponsor ini sering sekali di di apa namanya ditinggalkan ya tidak diisi. So uh, usually I see this metadata remains blank. Ya. Jadi ini harus diisi. Gitu. Setidaknya ibu dan bapak ya bisa mengisinya dengan uh, respect dikti kalau memang uh, uh, ibu dan bapak tidak menerima dana dari swasta atau dari sumber lain atau setidaknya dari universitas. Jadi ibu dan bapak bisa selalu menulis itu. So the minimum entry that you should uh, do, you should uh, choose is to write the name of your affiliation or university or ministry of research and education that's the list you can do to fill fill in this yeah unless your research is clearly funded by non-governmental uh, 
funding bodies ya seperti kalau ibu dan bapak dapat proyek dari swasta dari pabrik obat dari perusahaan X misalnya perusahaan migas contoh saya maka uh, kalau ibu dan tidak ibu dan bapak tidak mendapatkan dana dari swasta maka lebih baik diisi dana dari universitas atau dari kementerian gitu ya karena uh, sedikit banyak ya more or less our activity as researcher or lecturer in Indonesia is funded by the government more or less most of the funding coming from the government jadi itu itu penting kemudian oke okay, language itu selalu diisi biasanya language ini ya yeah. uh, oke okay, jadi itu nah dari situlah kemudian uh, kalau metadata itu diisi maka seandainya kita analyze search result maka ini bisa muncul ya. Uh, wait. Nah, ini dokumen by country ini muncul. Kemudian funding sponsor ini akan muncul ya. Jadi uh, if if I if I'm the president I would go to see this chart, right? If I'm the minister I will go to see this chart. So how much that uh, our funding will trans has been transformed into an article, right? Jadi ini karena selalu jadi selalu funding dari negara dari Ristek Dikti dalam hal ini selalu mencaratkan artikel, ya. Yeah? Jadi uh, it's very common for the funding bodies to to uh, ask you to to request an article uh, as an output for the research that they funded, ya. Yeah? Kemudian dokumen by subject dan seterusnya. Nah, oke. Okay. Nah, sekarang di tahap ini adalah bahwa metadata yang ibu dan bapak masukkan sebagai penulis, kemudian metadata itu diolah oleh pen, uh, jurnal editor, kemudian di submit ke say Crossref misalnya. Uh, metadata itu itu sifatnya data. Ya. Nah, scopus dalam hal ini adalah mengisi layer service. Ya, jadi data metadata yang ibu dan bapak hasilkan, the metadata that you produce cannot automatically uh, create this graph, right? Or create the other graph. So it should be another entities, another organization that create this graphs. Yeah. So Scopus, as well as also Lens in this case, ya yeah, ini juga database tapi ini gratis, free database, ya. Yeah. And also dimensions here. Ini juga uh, database yang gratis. Create value, more values based on your metadata, based on the data, uh, the free data that they can uh, they can uh, get. Ya, yeah. kemarin uh, uh, our colleague from uh, Crossref, ya. Yeah has mentioned that all the raw data the, the metadata is is free to be to be uh, reused by by people right so we can ask uh, crossref or we can download the data itself uh, and then we can create the same charts here yeah jadi layer data itu it should be completely free ya yeah? crossref dalam ini dalam hal ini in this case sudah melakukan itu. So Crossref in this case had done uh, to free the data, yeah, the raw data. So this organization uh, like Scopus, Lens, Dimension can also use their data and create this this visualization to to give you more values, right? More information, not just data. Okay. Uh, and then what about uh, Garuda, yeah. Let me get back to this three database. Yeah, the difference between Scopus and the other database is that the search result is can be downloaded or not. Yeah, uh, if you search hydrogeology in this case, this is the search result. Ini adalah hasil pencariannya. Kalau saya klik ini, kemudian kita uh, CSV export. Yeah. Ini adalah metadata yang ada di Scopus ya, yang sudah mereka hasilkan. Ini metadatanya nih contrengannya. Itu bisa kita ekspor, ya. 
karena ini kurang dari 2000 dokumen maka bisa langsung semuanya diekspor langsung. Kalau ini lebih dari 2000, Scopus akan minta waktu untuk kemudian mengirimkan kembali ke kita, ya. Nah, bedanya adalah kalau lens dan dimension hasil pencarian tadi bisa di-download tanpa harus punya subscription ke database itu ya karena free. Tapi kalau Scopus harus up dan web of science we have to subscribe to their service before we can download the metadata, right? So that is the the main difference ya. Kemudian Garuda bagaimana ya? Garuda adalah database uh, yang dimiliki oleh Indonesia ya oleh uh, riset Dikti yang membuat riset Dikti ya so Garuda is a scientific database created by uh, the Ministry of Research and Education and you can see here they index uh, over 1.4 million of articles ya? and so on and so forth you can see it here but the problem is this uh, This system, uh, this system use the the raw metadata, raw data in form of metadata that submit that uh, are submitted by the journal editors, right? But if we try to search something here, yeah, we can we cannot download the 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 search result ya. Jadi di sini kita tidak bisa mendownload metadata dari hasil pencarian ini, tidak seperti tiga database yang sebelumnya. Nah, ini menurut saya juga satu hal yang perlu dikoreksi karena layer data, data layer is not open in this case ya. So, uh, lapisan data itu tidak dibuka di sini in this case ya. On the other hand, dalam dalam kesempatan yang lain Uh, Clarified Analytics akan mengadopsi data dari Garuda ini. Ya. Jadi data yang sama ini bisa dicari persis sama dengan Web of Science. Right? The different is the main different is say if we have has this view from Web of Science, ya. katakanlah ini Web of Science. Saya search hidrogeologi dengan bahasa Indonesia, maka artikel-artikel yang ada di Garuda ini akan muncul. Nah, tapi bisa di download metadatanya. Nah, untuk bisa mendownload, kita harus subscribe to Web of Science. So, uh, if we want to download the metadata, we have to subscribe to Web of Science. So, the only people that can download this data is those people who has who have subscription to Web of Science. <laughs> Jadi, ini perlu dikoreksi menurut saya. Jadi, justru mestinya ya data layer data itu free dengan dengan semua plus minusnya jadi data di Garuda ini mestinya juga bisa di download metadatanya ya jadi tidak harus setelah gabung dengan web of science baru kemudian bisa di download it's clearly a wrong way to to see the importance of metadata ya jadi begitulah metadata itu nah last last thing that I want I want to mention why metadata is very important Misal begini, ya. ini adalah repository, ya. Zenodo ini seperti Rina Archive dan seterusnya. Nah, metadata itu kenapa harus free? Kenapa harus di, uh, bisa dibuka? Ya. Karena ini di Chrome dan Firefox, ya. saya tidak tahu kalau Microsoft Edge nah, punya. Ya. Microsoft Edge itu seperti Internet Explorer. Ya, tapi siapa sih yang masih pakai Internet Explorer zaman sekarang? Ya. Jadi either Firefox atau Chrome. I use Chrome, Firefox in this case. Ya. Jadi ada plugin namanya Bibit Now. Jadi Bibtex. Jadi ini tuh untuk mendownload metadata dari page apapun yang ada di layar. Ya. Contoh ini, klik. Nah ini adalah metadata. Nah metadata ini ketika ibu dan bapak copy and paste it into Zotero or Mendeley platform maka ini langsung bisa mengisi box-box metadata yang perlu diisi jadi ibu dan bapak tidak perlu meregister satu-satu ya diketik satu cukup copy and paste on Zotero or Mendeley maka akan masuk ya nah se -se seberapa se sebegitu pentingnya metadata untuk bisa dibuka ya. untuk memudahkan users untuk memudahkan readers 
ya, uh, to make life easier for readers and users. Jadi ini bahkan blog saya pun seperti ini. Saya misalnya ini blog saya ya. Let me open one page ya. Dan kalau kita klik ini, maka otomatis ini juga metadata standar yang dibuat oleh WordPress. So every platform, just like Zenodo, uh, OJS platform, OPS platform, and, and the other platform, has their own uh, standard of metadata. Yeah. Nah, ini WordPress uh, blog itu punya metadata seperti ini. Jadi ini sudah cukup untuk membantu kita. Yeah. It's good enough to help us to identify the documents, right? And to reuse it in our uh, referencing uh, steps. Ya. Jadi se sebegitu pentingnya metadata bagi ibu dan bapak, baik ibu dan bapak itu sebagai authors. Ya. If you if you are an art authors, the metadata is very important uh, for you. If you input a very clear, very complete, and very detailed metadata, it's very useful for you. So the, the documents that you produce will likely to be found online by the potential users. At the end, they would be the potential, uh, the one that would potentially cite your documents, right? Jadi kemudian kalau dari sisi journal editor, yeah, uh, in the in the side of journal editor, um, having uh, complete metadata is also very important because that way your journal, your media, whatever it is, can be easily found online. Also, jadi jurnal-jurnal um, ibu dan bapak itu akan ditemukan dengan mudah oleh orang lain juga. Ini masalah hanya masalah discoverability. Jadi kenapa metadata itu penting? Karena sangat berkaitan with discoverability. So metadata is very uh, related to discover discoverability of your documents or your media in this case journal. So uh, my last sentence would be scientific. Uh, scientific, uh, scientific activities, scientific uh, research, scientific uh, efforts. Yeah, it's way beyond branding. Yeah, sangat jauh melampaui masalah branding jurnal. Yeah, bukannya tidak penting. Yeah, sedikit pentingnya. <laughs> pentingnya tidak terlalu banyak. Tidak sepenting masalah-masalah internal seperti ini. So the the importance is not more than this this aspect that we are discussing today. Ya, yeah? jadi tidak melebihi ini. Jadi justru ini yang lebih penting. Uh, this has more importance than the journal branding and also the reusability, reproducibility. Ya. Yeah? Uh, kemudian masalah data sharing yang kemarin saya tanyakan di Pak Kuman itu mestinya menjadi poin fokus dari ibu dan bapak-bapak. Either you are playing your role as a researcher and author, also if you're playing your role as journal editor. That's for now. Uh, my name is Dasapta. I'm working with uh, Institute Teknologi Bandung. Uh, uh, in my spare time, I also promote Uh, open science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pak Dasapta, for presenting about metadata. Uh, Pak Dasapta, ini sampai sekarang ini saya belum melihat ada pertanyaan yang muncul atau ada yang raise hand. Uh, mungkin Bapak Ibu sila, di, saya persilakan untuk bisa raise hand atau bertanya di Q&A chat box. Ya. Tapi Silakan karena Ibu belum ada. Karena belum ada, saya ada pertanyaan sendiri, Pak. Uh, previously, Pak Dasapta mention ada uh, keyword that must be existed ya. Ada tiga keyword yang seharusnya ada. Tadi bisa diulang, Pak. Yang pertama, kedua, ketiga. Oke, okay. uh, yang pertama itu masalah the problems uh, that you are going to solve, ya. Yeah? Say flooding, earthquake, and the other problems. Jadi terkait dengan substance-nya. Apakah problemnya yang ditulis, ya, atau solusinya yang ditulis? Ya, either you wrote, you go with your problems or your solutions. Ya, itu yang pertama. Okay. Yang kedua methods. 
ya metode itu harus ada because potential readers you, uh, there's a chance that they would search the the document that they need based on the methods ya kemudian yang terakhir ini karena saya orang geoscience ya spatial science jadi biasanya juga orang-orang yang mencari artikel tentang geologi mereka tidak mencari dengan kata kunci terkait dengan geologi seringkali mereka langsung combine dengan location ya geographical location sometimes people would search their documents based on uh, location also jadi gitu mbak tiga oke okay. ada tiga baik Uh, kemudian yang berikutnya lagi saya ingin menghighlight ya Pak yang dibicarakan hmm. oleh Pak ada satu lagi adalah about discovery uh, discoverability tidak yes. hanya tentang ber, uh, tidak hanya tentang branding tapi yeah. juga bagaimana itu bisa ditemukan. Yes. Uh, tapi kemudian uh, untuk raising awareness bahwa itu harus discovered itu uh, selama ini yang mungkin bisa pada Sabta ceritakan. Bagaimana me, apa namanya mengajak orang itu untuk kemudian memperhatikan metadata bahkan teman-teman uh, di pengelola jurnal sendiri juga masih awam untuk melengkapi metadata tapi kemudian ketika ada problem misalnya di dalam uh, artikel itu ada references tapi mm -hmm. tidak te, di references metadata tercrawling yeah. tapi yeah. tidak ada di dalam PDF itu kan uh, one of the problem kan jadi ini yeah. justru ada ini orang Indonesia tuh kadang uh, out of the box pak nggak ada ditemukan di artikel tapi di referensinya ada gitu kan jadi untuk hal-hal yang semacam yeah. ini mungkin bisa diceritakan pada serta uh, how we uh, raising the awareness about this important things of metadata gimana sih supaya orang-orang itu Uh, apa ya metadata itu uh, discoverage-nya nggak cuma about discoverage tapi juga apalagi mungkin bisa ya. oh sudah tampil ya pak videonya dari tadi soalnya ditanyakan loh dari tadi sudah saya klik ini video tapi nggak pernah keluar oh ini sudah pak ah, sudah jadi it's not my fault oke oke ya itu tadi pak gimana pak ada ya, dua jadi, pertanyaan juga ini yang sudah ini mungkin bisa sekalian Pak uh, ya. dari Pak Yulingga Nanda Hanif uh, terima kasih oh, Pak ya. Jakarta kata kunci selama ini hanya menjadi isian formalitas ya. uh, bagi penulis ini juga hmm. uh, mungkin awalnya karena mereka uh, they don't really ya. care about metadata ya, ya. Uh, padahal itu merupakan the best way to find matching articles bisa dikatakan sebagai power ya. Uh, yang sudah kita terbitkan di media yang ya. terpublikasi. Bagaimana cara terbaik menentukan ya. kata kunci? Oke, okay, nah, uh, nanti bisa dijawab lagi ya Pak. Ya, baik. Ada Jadi dua lagi. Ya, saya Bukan akan dijawab langsung... dulu deh. Yang dua saya simpan dulu. Baik. Jadi yang pertama dari Mbak Diana tadi ya. Jadi metadata itu penting, tapi untuk bisa merasakan pentingnya to feel the importance you have to do it to yourself. Jadi coba googling yourself. Ya, jadi uh, un untuk menguji to test the importance of, of metadata. Untuk menguji pentingnya metadata, coba google diri anda sendiri. Jadi ibu dan bapak bisa menggoogle nama ibu dan bapak sendiri. Uh, bisa pakai Google Scholar ya. Atau mungkin pakai database yang tadi ya, Scopus, Lens, Dimension, coba di Google namanya sendiri. Kemudian muncul hasil pencarian, kemudian ibu dan bapak nilai apakah hasil pencarian itu sudah sesuai dengan apa yang ibu dan bapak kerjakan. Ya. You need to assess if the search result would perfectly resembles you and what you're doing. Yeah. your articles that you produce, the research that you do, uh, apakah hasil research, uh, apakah search resultsnya itu mencerminkan itu? Ya, coba. Nah, kalau sudah mencerminkan itu, berarti ibu dan bapak sudah betul me me memasukkan keyword. Ya. So if you think that the search result is is very much uh, perfectly resembles your uh, yourself, maka you you're doing a good keyword choose uh, choosing yeah 
uh, keyword selection itu. Nah sekarang keyword uh, metadata itu juga sering dijadikan sebagai tools untuk uh, melakukan manu manipulasi ya karena komputer ya bahasa mesin bahasa komputer actually they're not reading the document itself. Ya, jadi bahasa mesin kata orang ya because my background is geology I just heard someone from IT says this so I I will talk you what he said <laughs> jadi komputer <laughs> itu tidak membaca PDF document yang anda upload ya komputer is not reading the PDF document but the metadata along with documents that computer reads jadi komputer itu membaca metadata jadi ketika Misalnya ada indeks ya seperti scopus, lens, dimension dan lain-lain membaca dokumen ibu dan bapak kemudian memasukkan identitas yang ada di situ misalnya sitasi maka yang di yang di apa namanya yang dibaca itu adalah metadatanya bukan dokumen PDF-nya kemudian dia baca oh this is the list of references references bukan itu ya nah Artinya apa? Metadata dengan dokumen itu harus completely match, nggak bisa berbeda. Kecuali kalau ibu dan bapak ingin memanipulasinya. Ya, jadi tidak ada alasan lain bahwa dokumen dengan metadata itu harus berbeda. Kecuali kalau ada motivation in manipulating the data. Ya, jadi dua dokumen ini harus sama persis. Karena komputer tidak membaca PDF dokumen, tapi membaca metadata. Jadi ini harus persis. Itu mbak, jadi mestinya nggak dilakukan lah. That's why I, I don't endorse citation counting ya. Jadi kenapa saya nggak mendorong sitasi dihitung-hitung ya seperti narasumber kemarin. That's not me. Oke. Okay. Uh, jadi Pak Yuli nggak? Different point of view. Ya, yeah. no the correct point of view, not different point of view. <laughs> Oke. Okay. Okay. Sekarang Pak Yuli nggak ya? I will read uh, langsung pertanyaannya ya mbak ya. Jadi mm -hmm. pertama Pak Yulinga uh, best way to find matching article. Oke, okay, discoverability. Tadi sudah saya jelaskan Mas Yulinga. Jadi keywords itu setidaknya ada tiga. Lokasi, metode, sama problems atau solution yang ditawarkan. Ya, setidaknya tiga itu. Nah, jumlah kata kuncinya bisa maksimum bisa lima, tidak ada masalah, tapi setidaknya itu merefleksikan tiga komponen tadi. Gitu ya. Kemudian okay. Mbak Arafik Ya. Metadata terbitan Mama. tidak begitu mudah. Oke, Rina Kef dalam hal ini memang tidak melakukan apa-apa selain melakukan hmm. promosi seperti ini. Bahkan isi metadata itu dengan berkomunikasi, berkomunikasi dengan penulis. Kalau uh, submission metadata dari penulis itu sangat minim. ya Itu kurang lebih. How to get high okay, index yang... from our articles? Itu mestinya hmm. nanya ke narasumber yang kemarin. <laughs> Jadi high index... Hai indeks itu cuma rumus di jumlah kemudian dibagi bu ya. Jadi kalau ingin artikelnya tinggi hai indeksnya ya sitasinya harus ditambah. Tapi caranya bagaimana? Silakan ditanya ke narasumber yang kemarin. Mungkin ibu dan bapak. Ada yang terlewat ini bapak ini dari Abdul ya? Ghani Haji. Ya. Dari... Ini mau saya jawab juga. Ada ah. kasus sebenarnya melengkapi metadata saat register paper. Nah, nah. ini pak. Oh. Nah, jadi. Jadi eh, begini ya, selama metadatanya itu diupdate tapi tidak ada unsur manipulasi mestinya itu dimungkinkan. Betul ya, sebagai jurnal editor pasti memungkinkan itu. Tapi kalau misalnya update metadata itu untuk memanipulasi, mending jangan dipikirin itu. <laughs> Jadi jangan untuk motivasi itu, ya. Nah, ini kemudian Pak Hamdan ini, ini kadang membuat saya malas merujuk dari jurnal karena metadatanya tidak lengkap dan Mendeley datanya jadi kacau. Nah, betul, Pak. Iya, betul. Nah, tapi di sisi lain ketika Pak Hamdan menjadi author, if you being a, an author, you should complete your metadata gitu ya to help the journal editor. Karena ada kemungkinan there's possibility that journal editor cannot fill in the metadata completely because the authors ya did not entry the metadata as complete as possible. Gitu ya. Gitu kurang lebih. Okay. Pak Rumawi, yeah. metadata yeah. mix citation easier. Ya, pasti. Metadata seperti tadi oh. saya sudah demokan ya. Kalau metadata lengkap dan dibuka, maka sitasinya akan mudah sekali. Gitu. Kemudian memperbaiki metadata sedangkan metadata. Ah, ini, itu kenapa saya ini ya tidak terlalu 
ngefans sama pengindeks. Ya, itu kenapa pengindeks selalu dijadikan tujuan? Ya, karena selalu uh, ini pertanyaannya begitu ya. Jadi karena kalau saya sih lebih baik itu jadi KPI pak. Nah itu dia. Pengindeks itu jadi KPI, not the content of the article itself. Ya, yeah? it's the wrong kind of KPI. <laughs> yeah. Jadi, jadi lebih baik metadatanya diperbaiki saja. Yeah? Masalah urusan dengan pengindeks. Kalau menurut saya bisa kita email rasanya ya kalau pengindeks itu. Ya, yeah? if uh, pengindeks itu ingin ingin diterima di masyarakat juga harus komunikasi komunikatif ya dengan para penggunanya menurut saya. Jadi jangan terlalu tergantung dengan pengindeks. Jadi tapi eh. tidak menjawab juga ya Pak. Berarti kalau sudah terlanjur keliru begitu, berarti harus menghubungi. Ya tinggal diupdate, ke, di, tinggal diupdate, kemudian kontak pengindeks gitu saja. Okay. Karena kalau saya jadi pengindeks, ya kalau saya jadi pengindeks, maka saya akan perhatikan orang-orang dari Indonesia karena. Orang Indonesia itu, uh, as Van, Vanessa said yesterday, have registered 700,000 of contents every year. Maka kalau saya jadi pengindeks dan saya ingin terkenal, saya akan perhatikan orang Indonesia. Gitu. It should be. Yeah. Atau yeah. mungkin bisa menghubungi pengelola jurnalnya, Pak? Mungkin. Iyalah, bisa mestinya. Tapi intinya jangan okay. pakai ada manip manipulasi lah. Gitu ya. So there are two ways ya kita menghubungi hmm. pengelola jurnalnya atau menghubungi uh, pengindeksnya. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay, nah ini terakhir lagi. mungkin Bu Vitalis ya. Ya. Bu Vitalis. Nah ini tuh saya masalah apa namanya uh, standar penulisan nama ya menurut saya tidak ada. Kalau saya sih begini tulis nama selengkap mungkin jadi jangan disingkat. Misalnya begini, Vitalis Ayu ya, Ayu Vitalis gitu. Kalau nama ibu Vitalis Ayu Rahma maka Rahma koma Vitalis Ayu. Jadi jangan disingkat pada saat mengentry metadata. Kebayang ya? Biarkan nanti mesin yang merubah nama ibu dan bapak itu menjadi Rahma VA atau Rahma V Ayu begitu ya. Karena mereka punya algoritma. Jadi menurut saya pada saat submission tiga nama itu harus ditulis ya karena itu untuk menghormati orang tua juga yang memberi nama. Gitu Bu Vitalis. Ada Oke, okay. sepertinya apakah ya. ada lagi yang di question and answer? Mungkin ada yang mau raise hand yes, okay. untuk bertanya ya. secara langsung. Ya, sambil nanti saya have... ini kalau ada yang raise hand silakan ya. Ya. Uh, ini juga ada beberapa Uh, respon di chat Pak terima kasih sudah menjelaskan ada juga yang I agree so uh, memang uh, mengkampanyekan open science itu one of them itu tidak tergantung tadi citation salah satunya and the other is not okay. only based on the indexing ya Pak ya mm -hmm. Ya. Kayaknya udah ini semua Pak, nih Pak pertanyaan, pertanyaan. Ya Pak Pak Abdul Gan ini saya batasi dua ya kalau ada pertanyaan lagi bisa nanti lewat Bu Diana dikirim ke saya. Jadi intinya masalah nama yang hanya satu kata ya ini memang jadi masalah. Bisa saja nama itu diulang dua kali atau pakai nama orang tua kan di kalau ibu dan bapak yang Muslim ya saya tidak tahu agama lain itu kan ada bin atau binti ya. Jadi tinggal bin apa begitu ya. Ini menurut saya bisa dipakai satu-satunya selain di paspor. Jadi sistem paspor menurut saya bisa dipakai Pak Abdul Ghani. Pak Hamdan, ketika publish di jurnal bereputasi rata-rata berbayar menyebabkan penulis lain mengakses karena kendala biaya. Oke, okay. uh, jelas. Jadi kalau close close access ya atau subscription based on subscription memang sulit kita mengharapkan orang bisa Anu, mendapatkan ya kan tapi kalau ibu dan bapak ingin bisa open access pun tidak ada lebih banyak jurnal open access yang tidak menarik bayaran dibanding yang yang menarik bayaran nah masalahnya adalah KPI tadi meminta kita justru untuk membayar ya so those KPI force us to spend money not save money so that's another indicator of the wrong kind of KPI In my thoughts. Okay. Sudah uh, semua saja. <laughs> ya, ini Pak Ratodi sebetulnya mau raise hand. Saya persilakan Pak Ratodi untuk raise hand. Silakan Pak Ratodi. Pak Ratodi. Ini tadi uh, ada 
chatnya udah dari agak tadian sih pak. Oke. Okay. Ada dua partisipan yang juga raise hand, Pak Ashar, silakan Pak Ashar. Ya, silakan Pak. Uh, thank you, Pak Dasarta. Uh, ya. Saya sangat senang sekali. I'm so happy ya, karena memang open science dan metadata ini sangat penting sekali. Metadata sangat penting sekali. Dan faktanya memang sedikit sedikit uh, ber, uh, ngasih feedback saja ini buat ya. Pak Dasarta. Ya. Memang faktanya ya. beberapa pengelola jurnal nakal ya. Memang itu bermain di metadata itu. Atau memang uh, tinggi tinggian high index ini sangat sangat famous di Indonesia. <laughs> Kenapa bisa Toxic gitu? environment. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Toxic environment pada saat I do agree. Jadi nggak tahu ya, apakah dia yang punya high index tinggi uh, seperti itu bisa uh, dekat dengan langit gitu. <laughs> tahu juga. Tapi sebenarnya yeah. tadi pada hakikatnya yang bisa main pada saat itu saya sangat sepakat sekali. Thank you, thank you pada saat itu. You're welcome, Pak Azad. Ada Bu Indriani, Pak Dasarta yang juga raise hand. Silakan ya. Bu Indriani. Oke, okay. Bu Indriani, saya persilakan sudah saya ask to unmute. Silakan Bu Indriani. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Tentang ini uh, Pak Dasarta, ketika ya. artikel itu sudah kita submit di uh, di Google Scholar. Ya. Kemudian kita ngeling ke Sinta, ya. tapi ini ada data yang kita waktu itu referensinya manual. Apa kita tarik hmm. lagi atau gimana, Pak? Supaya dia terindek, h-indeknya terbaca dan sitasinya terbaca. Ya, Cuma... ya. saya oke. Okay. Terus terang, saya awam masalah ini. Jadi, kalau di kepala saya sih, silakan nanti kalau ada yang bisa jawab secara teknis ya, tapi di kepala saya sih mestinya metadata itu mestinya bisa dilakukan ya mestinya gitu ya. masalah prosedur memang ya harus tinggal dipenuhi saja harus kontak siapa gitu tapi mestinya bisa diperbaiki Bu Indriani ya gitu tapi untuk teknisnya kurang saya kurang paham mohon maaf mungkin saya bisa mengundang Pak Tanzil Mutasem untuk menjawab silakan Pak ya. Tanzil ada ada di panelis Pak Tanzil silakan. Pertanyaan Bu Indriani ini sepertinya ya. bisa dijawab oleh jenengan. Silakan Pak Tanzil. Terkait update metadata, Bu. Ya, betul. Ya, update metadata. Ya, tadi saya agak putus-putus ya, Bu. Itu maksudnya update metadata setelah publish gitu kan? Up. Ya, di Google Scholar Halo. itu uh, referensinya, manu, uh, artikelnya referensinya manual, bukan pakai referencing manager. Gimana caranya update sudah terlanjur terindeks di Google Scholar? Oh, ya. Jadi masalah kerapian metadata ini sebetulnya untuk bisa update itu nggak ada uh, masalah, namun untuk yang kaitannya yang substansial, itu kan pastinya menggunakan kayak eratum korigendum gitu ya, tapi kalau non-substansial kayak cuma merapikan uh, mendelinya, kemudian ada kurang spasinya pada apa uh, metadata gitu, itu langsung aja di update aja, karena Google Scholar itu nantinya akan me, uh, ngambil ulang datanya kalau di DOI-nya, maka itu perlu di update ulang DOI-nya jadi di register nanti otomatis update dan itu nggak akan kena tas biaya lagi, kalau DOI-nya Pak, Dan, uh, artinya data diambil lagi ya Pak? Data ditarik ya, lagi, artikel ditarik betul. lagi, baru referensinya kita uh, ditarik apa? lagi. Jadi kalau yang uh, pengindek yang sifatnya otomatis kayak Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic, kemudian uh, yang dimensi dari DOI itu semuanya kan serba otomatis gitu kan ya? Yeah. Nah, jadi kan kita kita perlu hanya sekedar mementerik aja uh, untuk yang DOI-nya di terulang untuk yang Google Scholar-nya mereka akan mengambil ulang mengupdate data itu lagi gitu. Hmm. Berarti data saya ambil referensinya saya rubah ke yeah. men menggunakan Mendeley itu Pak ya. Oke. Okay. Untuk lebih yeah. Yeah, Terima besar. kasih. Sudah upload hmm. hampir dua tahun tidak tersitasi Pak. Oh Mungkin ini ada... masalah sitasinya itu belum tentu juga Bu karena masalah hmm. sitasi ini masalahnya kompleks banyak hal yang perlu kita lihat. Apakah itu dia tersitasi apa apa tidaknya itu? Jadi tersitasi yang nggak terdeteksi itu problemnya banyak bu masalahnya. Oh. Ya. ya. Dan ya, ini terima. sebenarnya ada yang raise hand lagi nih Pak Dasarta, hmm. Pak Rafik ya. 
Yeah. Saya persilakan langsung Pak ini waktu kita udah habis sebenarnya. So actually yeah, yeah. our time it's already run out. But uh, Vanessa just a little, a little more minute ya Vanessa ya. Yeah, And I will give, give it to yeah. Of course. Continue. We can give more time okay. for famous singer. Oke, okay, silakan Pak Arafik. Uh, terima kasih uh, Mbak Zulit. Uh, yeah. <coughs> terkait dengan metadata, uh, mungkin kita agak kurang ke agak kurang ke trigger gitu ya pengelola jurnal ya. di Indonesia karena uh, selama ini juga pengalaman kita banyak mengikuti webinar itu yang selalu dibahas uh, mungkin lebih banyak ke langkah-langkah uh, terakreditasi kemudian ya. um, apa uh, masih kurang bagaimana melengkapi metadata kemudian ya. kalau metadata yang sudah terbit itu misal kurang lengkap ya. uh, apakah kita boleh kan kita selalu selalu berputar-putar di sana apa kita boleh yes. etis nggak kita ubah metadatanya kayak gitu jadi ya. jadi kita tuh kayak masih kurang ke trigger aja gitu ya. kemudian juga terkait dengan uh, melengkapi metadata kita masih karena uh, mungkin mayoritas yang sudah yang sudah uh, mengaktifkan doi itu seharusnya itu seharusnya juga uh, uh, menggunakan fasilitas cited by kayak gitu jadi Ketika ya. kita sudah mengaktifkan cited by-nya, eh, maka otomatis nanti hak indeks dari artikel-artikel yang kita sitasi pun artikel yang yang artikel kita sendiri yang kita sitasi, misal artikel yang jurnal kita sendiri terbitkan hmm. kemudian kita sitasi sendiri, itu juga akan meningkat seperti itu. Jadi rekan-rekan eh, pengelola jurnal, eh, ayolah kayak gitu. Jangan berpaku di, eh, kalau misalnya tidak ada di aturan akreditasi, kita nggak melakukannya kayak gitu. Misalnya ya. kayak metadata ini kan, jarang jarang ada di ya. mungkin tidak ada di aturan akreditasi kayak gitu jadi ya. jangan jangan uh, jangan apa ya jangan tidak berani untuk untuk jadi, mengambil jangan membatasi kita. diri iya seperti yang Pak Dasapta sering ucapkan kita itu berputar-putar di aturan yang kita sendiri buat seperti itu padahal kita bisa go beyond uh, di luar akreditasi itu sebenarnya untuk hmm. menjadi lebih ya lebih baik bisa bersaing dengan hmm jurnal-jurnal luar negeri yang yang pengelolaannya sudah ya. bagus sekali kayak gitu tapi ya. ya mungkin dengan kita hal kecil saja itu itu insya Allah kita kita bisa lah kayak ya. gitu ya mungkin ini ini sekedar insight saja terima kasih Ajakan, ya. bagus mas terima kasih Pak Arafik terima ya. kasih Pak Arafik jadi sebagai pengelola jurnal itu memang sebaiknya bertanya apa yang tidak boleh dilakukan tapi jangan bertanya apa yang harus saya lakukan Ya, jadi yang ditanyakan tuh mestinya saya tidak boleh apa <laughs> itu aja yang kan pasti lebih sedikit dibanding yang harus dilakukan kan? nah itu jadi itulah <laughs> oke okay, uh, kita sudah melebihi dari jamnya sebenarnya ya. pada Sabta tapi uh, I, I believe Vanessa will allow me to ask uh, Pak Dasapta untuk have a closing statement silakan Pak Dasapta ya yep. closing statement that my closing I just mentioned my closing statement so sebagai seorang researcher sebagai seorang uh, apa author journal editor so in the scientific community we should ask uh, we should understand what things that we we are not allowed to do not ethical to do that's the important thing yeah outside to that di luar dari itu maka arahkan seluruh activity, seluruh efforts be directed to how to make your work more visible in any ways that you can that lawful ya yang yang dibolehkan oleh hukum dan yang ibu dan bapak lakukan. Jadi mestinya harus dibuka pikirannya begitu. Kita sama-sama belajar, let's learn from each other and I'm sure uh, well apa looking forward your sharing eh, materials from all of you. Thank you, Mbak Gena. Oke, okay, sama-sama Pak Dasapta. Terima kasih sudah memberikan satu uh, presentasi dan pencerahan sekaligus insight tentang metadata dan discoverability tadi dari so, sudut pandang so, open yeah. science community. One, one, yeah, one thing, yeah, one thing you, you can click this link. Ya, SID slash AC perspektif untuk membaca artikel kami di sini di Zoom background saya. Jadi 
Oke. Okay. Ya. Mungkin bisa diketik di chat, Pak. Oh, Jadi ya. supaya bisa lebih memudahkan untuk semua attendees and panelis to check the link. Sudah, itu. Ini adalah artikel yang baru terbit ya, Pak ya? Paling baru minggu kemarin. Oke. Okay. Baik, uh, sebelum saya kembalikan, eh, saya kembalikan. Sebelum saya lanjutkan ke acara yang berikutnya, saya sudah cek juga tidak ada pertanyaan lanjutan dan sebagainya. Uh, baiklah, oke, okay. uh, Vanessa, I will give uh, this floor to back to you and Paul. I think Paul is already here. Amanda is already here, so you can start to presenting. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> Thank you very much, okay. uh, Makasi. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Despata. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, there was lots of discussion, lots of great questions. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share our presentation. Give me one second. Uh, yeah, uh, I also want to Uh, tell to all the attendants karena ini banyak yang bertanya uh, Bapak Ibu akan mendapatkan email setelah acara ini selesai jadi tidak perlu ada apa namanya uh, yang bertanya lagi ada recording atau bagaimana sudah ada dan link untuk mendapatkan sertifikat sudah dibagikan oleh Vanessa nanti akan saya bagikan kembali linknya dan feedback juga ada di sana oke okay. Thank you, Vanessa. We will start your presentations after this. Okay. Thank you. Um, and thanks for, for mentioning the, uh, feed, uh, the feedback form and the certificate. Yes, we'll share the link uh, to everyone at the end. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback um, and it should automatically send you a certificate to email. We'll also be sharing the, all the slides and the recordings uh, within a few days. This hopefully will be by the end of the week. Um, but it might be early next week, but either way, you will have it soon. Okay, so uh, continuing our, th our theme of metadata for today, uh, tomorrow there will be a talk where we will also give some more examples about the uses of metadata and why we think it's so important at Crossref. Um, I think we're very, very aligned with what uh, Mr. Despata was saying. Um, so uh, there will be more, we'll be discussing that more tomorrow. Um, but today we're going to talk about how you send this metadata to Crossref, the different methods of which you can use to register your content with us. Um, and we'll, there'll also be a couple of recordings. So there will be a demonstration of how to use our web deposit form. And also uh, our colleagues at PKP have made a recording for us on how to use the OJS platform for anyone that's not already really familiar with it. Um, So uh, my name is Vanessa, and I'm also joined today by my colleagues, um, Amanda Bartel, who is our head of member experience, and Paul Davis, who's our technical support specialist. Um, so Paul will be helping us in the Q&A today. So if you put some questions into that box, um, he will get back to you there. And we will also hopefully have some time at the end as well to answer some questions live um, as well. Um, as I've said, we're sharing the slides, so don't worry about making notes of any links that you see. We'll make sure that you have these afterwards. Um, so I'm also going to do something to hopefully help because um, we are unable to speak uh, bilingually, unfortunately, in both Bahasa and English. Um, so if you wish, you can turn on closed captioning. Um, this might help. You can click the book, uh, the button that says live transcript and then view full transcript. And then this should come up along the bottom of your screen um, with the, the written words of what we're saying. Um, so this isn't perfect. It doesn't transcribe everything perfectly, but it might just help a bit. Um, so I'm now going to pass over to Amanda, who's going to get us started today um, and tell us a little bit more about our agenda. Thanks, Vanessa. Good morning, everyone. Um, so here's the uh, agenda for our presentation. So we'll start with talking a little bit about DOIs and metadata. So what a DOI is and why working with Crossref is about much more than just DOIs. We'll then talk you through the different ways that you can register your DOIs and metadata with us. 
So Vanessa will explain how to register XML files with us directly. But if you aren't able to register XML directly and instead you need to use a helper tool, um, don't worry, we have you covered. If you're using the OJS platform from PKP, then you'll be using the OJS plugin. And we have a brief video demo from the team at PKP to walk you through that plugin. If you aren't using the OJS platform and you need a help at all, you can also use our web deposit form. And again, there'll be another brief video demo from Paul to walk you through that tool. After the video demos, we'll move on to how to make corrections or additions to your metadata and also what to do if your content moves to another publisher. And finally, at the end, there's going to be time for a few questions. So let's start with the basics of DOIs and metadata. So DOIs are not an indicator of the quality of a publication or the organisation that registers them, nor is it a mark of the quality of the research that's presented. Instead, a DOI is a persistent identifier for that item of content, and it's a persistent link to the location of that content on the internet. Each DOI has a resolution URL, which is the website address for that particular piece of content. And if that piece of content moves on the internet, so for example, it moves to a different publisher on a different website, the Crossref member can update the resolution URL. And this means that anyone who uses the DOI to cite the article knows they'll always be able to find the article again in the future, even if it's moved. But joining Crossref is about much more than just registering that identifier and creating that persistent link because along with the DOI and its resolution URL, you'll be registering rich metadata about that content. And we heard earlier about why that's so important. And it's also important that members are able to keep their metadata updated if things change in the future, or indeed, if you get more information. Um, so it's a lot more than just registering a DOI and then you're done. It's a ongoing commitment to work with your DOIs and your metadata. And all this metadata that our members provide to us is made freely available in our open APIs, meaning that your content is then much more discoverable in lots of different places. So let's look at the structure of a Crossref DOI in a bit more detail. So, a DOI is composed of three sections, and you can see here we've got a DOI in three different colours. So the red part is the resolver address. Um, this is what makes the DOI an actionable link, so it resolves in the browser to wherever your content is hosted. The blue bit is the prefix and there's a different prefix assigned to each member when they join. And finally, the yellow section is the suffix. So this is a section that's assigned by the publisher and is unique to each, public, uh, each content item. So let's look at prefixes and suffixes in a bit more detail. So, when you join Crossref, you're assigned a unique prefix for your account. So that blue section on the diagram. Uh, it'll have the format 10 dot and then some numbers. Um, you might see some that have four digits like uh, our example here. Um, originally, prefixes had ten di uh, four digits, but They've been five digits since 2012, so nowadays you'll tend to have a five digit prefix. 
some members have one publication that they want to register with us and others have multiple publications and you can use your one prefix to register all of your content even if it's across multiple different journals or if it's across different content types so books and journals for example If you need to add a new title or a new publication, you don't need to let us know. You can just go ahead and register your new title on your prefix and a title record will automatically be created for that title. There's no limit to the number of DOIs you can create, nor is there a minimum number required. Um, and we know each member has a unique publishing schedule. It might be weekly, it might be monthly, it might even be yearly, um, and that's fine. DOIs can be registered at any time. So let's move on and look at the DOI suffix. So this is the final section of your DOI that you as the member create. And we get many questions from new members about how to create a suffix for their DOI. So it's important to remember that a DOI is what we call an opaque identifier, which means the DOI itself doesn't necessarily have any meaning. So there isn't any prescribed formula that you have to follow. Um, and it's important that the DOI suffix doesn't state anything, anything identifying, all of that is done within the metadata that you register. So the best advice we can offer is just to keep your DOI suffixes consistent, simple and short, um, and particularly don't include anything in the suffix that could change in the future because your DOI um, will be there for the long term. It's not something you can update in the future. This DOI will be the persistent identifier for that content. When you're creating your suffix, you can use the letters A to Z, um, the numbers zero to nine, and certain characters like hyphens. Um, and there's a link on the slide here where there's more information on our website about creating your suffixes. So once you have decided on your DOI and you've registered it with us, it's important that you display that DOI on the landing page. So the landing page is the resolution URL, so where that DOI resolves to. So the landing page needs to contain a full bibliographic citation. So readers know when they've clicked on a link that they've definitely arrived at the right place. The landing page also needs to have your DOI displayed on the page as a URL. And this means if anybody wants to cite your article, they can just copy that URL from the page um, and then they've got it ready to put into their reference list and we know it'll resolve in future. Also on your landing page, you need to have a way to access the full text of the article. So if your content's available open access, the full text might just be there on the landing page. Alternatively, your full text might be behind the login or a subscription, and that's completely fine. Access to the full text is completely controlled by the publisher, but the landing page itself has to be accessible to everybody and not behind a paywall or a login. So when you register your content with us, you send us basic citation metadata for every item that you register. So this will include things like titles, authors, publication dates, issue numbers, ISSN or ISBN. So anything that describes the content that you're registering. We've got minimal requirements of this basic metadata because we need to support a variety of publication practices. 
but we do ask that you send us as much metadata as possible and that it's accurate and clean because as we heard earlier the more comprehensive your metadata is the more likely it is that your content will be discovered and disseminated Along with the basic citation metadata, we also collect other non-bibliographic data. Um, so this can include reference lists, funding data, ORCID IDs, license data, clinical trial information, abstracts, data about relationships between items, information on errata or retractions and updates, um, there's a whole range of items that you can register with us and we're always adding more metadata items so if you see that we can now collect an extra bit of information you can always update your metadata um, with that. So I said earlier that um, providing good metadata is important but it's equally important to maintain that metadata um, so keeping it up to date, if something changes, you can update the metadata that you register with Crossref. If you find you can suddenly collect a different piece of metadata, you might be able to start collecting ORCID IDs, for example. You can also add those. Um, and this will really help readers to find and use the content that you're registering, as well as just making sure that you've got up to date information. So there are many types of content that can be registered with us. Uh, most people know that you can register a DOI for journal articles, but we also accept um, all the types of content listed on this slide. Um, each content type has a unique set of metadata and format in our system. About 75% of our content uh, is journal articles, followed by 15% of books. Um, our newest type at the bottom there is grants. Um, this is still small, but it's a fast growing area as funders join Crossref and start to register identifiers for the grants that they offer. So that was a, a quick uh, a basic reminder about uh, DOIs and metadata and I'll hand you over to Vanessa now who's going to talk you through a few ways that you can actually register this content with us. Thanks Amanda. Okay so um, there are several different tools that are available that are to register your content with us um, and we're going to look today at how to do this via XML followed by some short video demos of the web deposit form and the OJS plugin. So all the metadata that comes into our system at Crossref is ultimately in XML format. And Crossref has its own metadata schema for our deposits. A schema is a set of rules, and this defines what can be included and in what format. <coughs> Our schema is fairly rigid, but it is comprehensive. So some of our members register their content by creating their own XML using the schema, and they upload this file to our system. You can find some documentation on our website about how to do this. Um, and this includes whether you are registering new content with us or whether you're adding um, additional metadata to your existing records. And this um, is a bit of an example of what that would look like um, at the XML file. Um, so it must include metadata and identifiers, and the elements need to appear in a defined order. Um, so as you'll see, um, each XML file that you send us has some member specific information in the head section. There's the email address, and this is what's used to send out notifications about when your file has been processed. So in this example, this is a basic journal article deposit. It contains uh, journal metadata, such as the title and the ISSN. There's issue and volume information. Um, so it's got the volume issue, the dates, 
And you can also assign an identifier uh, to a journal or a specific journal issue, if you like. The metadata collected for different content types uh, will differ, but you'll always be able to supply a title, a contributor, and a publication date for all of them, including some other basic metadata. However, not everyone uh, that we work with can um, create their own XML. So we do have a number of helper tools to help you do this. Um, and instead of walking you through these in the slides, I'm now going to play a couple of demonstrations of this. Um, so the first one um, is a demonstration of a web deposit form. So bear with me one second. I'm hoping this will just play in the screen, um, but let me know if you cannot hear it. I'll turn the volume up. Welcome to this video about using Crossref's web deposit form. I'll be using a test account today to show you how to register content using this tool. You can use the web deposit form to register a variety of content types, which you can find in the data type selection area here on the form. In today's example, though, I'll be registering journal, journal content. You can see my journal metadata at the side of the form, ready to copy and paste over to the form. This is in plain text form, which is best as no other formatting will be brought over, potentially causing issues when the XML file is being constructed. We'll start by entering metadata about the journal. If your journal has volumes and issues, you can complete the fields for that information. I'll start by adding the journal title that I have here. Next, the journal abbreviation. Here is the journal DOI. This is uh, the DOI that is going to resolve to the journal landing page. Is the journal URL. This is where the DOI will result to. In most cases, you'll probably have the ISSN that you'll be adding in here. In my example, I don't have one, but I do have a journal DOI. Now, either the journal DOI or an ISSN is required for this file to go through successfully. Next, I will add a publication date. You must include at least the year of the publication date under the publications date section. It's best to include the complete publication date, whether for print, online or both. Add your dates as numerical values such as, in this case, 2020, 04 for the month, and then 30 for the day. If you want to create just a title entry for your journal, you can click Submit Journal Issue DOI here now, and that will register exactly what's on the page already. If you have uh, articles to add, like we do here, then we can click on the Add Articles button, and it will take us to step three, where we can add the article metadata. You'll now see the beginnings of your XML file here being constructed in the deposit data section of the file. What we'll do is we'll continue adding metadata. And the more metadata that you can add, the more useful the record you'll create, and the more likely it is to be discovered through many services and tools that Crossref uh, that use the Crossref metadata. So we'll start adding the article metadata now. We'll add the article title, and I'll move down to the contributor section. First name of the first author. If possible, and if you have it, you can add an ID in there. If you had another contributor that you wanted to add in, then you could click on the Add Contributor to, uh, button here, and that would add a new set of boxes below where you could add the second author. Next, I want to add the article date. Now, to do this, I'll click on this button here. That will bring up an area for us to add the date for the article. Once again, using numbers, I will add the date as per our article metadata. Next, I'll add the article DOI. 
And lastly, the URL for which the DOI will resolve to. This will be where your article is located so that the DOI can resolve to the correct place. Now here we could continue adding another article um, until all of our articles are registered or we can click finish. I will click finish. This will take us on to step four. Here you'll need to enter your Crossref username and password and an email address. Your deposit results will be sent to this email address, so be sure to check that it's correct. Here I will add my details. Once they're all in, I will click deposit. If you're the deposit has been successfully sent to us, you will see this message where it says success. Your batch submission was successfully received and the name of the XML file down here which has been created. Now that it's been submitted, it does need to be processed. This message only means that we've successfully received it. The next part will it will need to go through our submission queue. Next, we will need to check our inbox to see if we've received the two emails that say that it was a successful submission. Here are the two emails. First one will be the XML that we've just created in the web deposit form here. You can keep this for your records. It's also um, very useful if you're wanting to learn more about XML and how to construct it. The second email will return the status of your submission, including your deposit ID or submission ID. Each submission is given a unique identifier so you can retrieve it and confirm the details of the submission. This email will also tell you whether your deposit has been successful and flag any errors that need to be corrected. This is also recorded in our admin tool. Here we have a look at the status. Here is the submission ID and the success email. Two records were processed, both successful. Almost immediately after registration, your DOA, DOI can normally be resolved. So we will go here, we will enter, we'll go to the DOI foundation website and we'll grab DOI, paste it in this, submit it and you'll see that the DOI is already resolving in our system. So that was our web deposit uh, demo. I'm sorry if it was quite small to see um, what we were typing in there, but hopefully the explanation uh, made that clear. Um, so I'll just move on to the next one. Um, oh, Welcome to this video about using cross. So again, I will try to play this. If it turns out that it's quite difficult to see, I will open this in YouTube um, and we might be able to see it a bit better, but we'll give it a go in the slides first. My name is Mike Mason. Uh, I work for the Public Knowledge Project, uh, creators of Open Journal Systems or OJS, and I'm also a librarian at the University of New Brunswick Libraries on the east coast of Canada. Uh, today, I'm going to walk you through very briefly the process of registering your DOIs in OJS and then submitting them to Crossref. Uh, for the purposes of today, I'm going to be using OJS 3.3, uh, which you may not be running yet, uh, but uh, it is the version that I'm using. Things won't be too different than they are in 3.2, uh, but you'll just want to pay attention uh, to where we're going uh, while we go through the process. <clears throat> so this is our example journal that I'm going to be submitting content to. And the first thing I'm going to do is walk you through turning on and then configuring the DOI plugin. The DOI plugin can be found underneath website in your uh, left sidebar. 
plugins, uh, and then you're going to want to scroll down a bit until you find uh, public identifier plugins. So we have DOI here. Uh, if it's not turned on, you'll want to click the little checkbox to turn it on. And we're going to hop into settings. So these are the settings for the DOI plugin. You'll see you have issues, articles, and galleys that you can assign content to. I recommend just using articles. It is the most straightforward. Some people do like to assign DOIs to everything, uh, but that can get a little complicated. Uh, and I would say it's probably not even all that necessary. Below that is the DOI prefix. You will have received your DOI prefix from Crossref or another registration agency before you start this process. Uh, you cannot assign DOIs to something without having a prefix. So it is an essential part of it. Ms. Mike Mason, uh, I work. My apologies. I'm just going to open it in um, YouTube just so that you can see um, a bit more clearly what, what Mike is talking about. Bear with me a second. Um, Ms. Mike Mason. Uh, I work for the Public Knowledge Project, uh, creators of Open Journal Systems or OJS, and I'm also a librarian at the University of New Brunswick Libraries on the east coast of Canada. Uh, today, I'm going to walk you through very briefly the process of registering your DOIs in OJS and then submitting them to Crossref. Uh, for the purposes of today, I'm going to be using OJS 3.3, uh, which you may not be running yet, uh, but uh, it is the version that I'm using. Things will be too different than they are in 3.2, uh, but you'll just want to pay attention uh, to where we're going uh, while we go through the process. <clears throat> so this is our example journal that I'm going to be submitting content to. And the first thing I'm going to do is walk you through turning on and then configuring the DOI plugin. The DOI plugin can be found underneath website in your uh, left sidebar, plugins, uh, and then you're going to want to scroll down a bit until you find uh, public identifier plugins. So we have DOI here. Uh, if it's not turned on, you'll want to click the little checkbox to turn it on. And we're going to hop into settings. So these are the settings for the DOI plugin. You'll see you have issues, articles, and galleys that you can assign content to. I recommend just using articles. It is the most straightforward. Some people do like to assign DOIs to everything, uh, but that can get a little complicated. Uh, and I would say it's probably not even all that necessary. Below that is the DOI prefix. You will have received your DOI prefix from Crossref or another registration agency before you start this process. Uh, you cannot assign DOIs to something without having a prefix. So it is an essential part of the process. And you can see that's reflected by the required icon here. Uh, below that is the DOI suffix. Uh, DOI suffixes um, can be a bit of a, a complicated thing for folks. What's important to remember about DOI suffixes is there's no reason for them to be human readable. Um, they don't need to really represent any information so that you can read them off the fly. They don't need to be the same every time. Uh, they can just be completely random if you, if you want. Um, what I recommend to most users is to use the default patterns set in OJS. It will be the most transparently simple for people. Um, but you can also turn on a section uh, that um, means that you can write your own DOI for every individual article as you go, uh, or you can make your own patterns based on this pattern generator. Uh, again, I recommend the default patterns if you don't want to spend much time thinking about it. Um, and you shouldn't have to really worry too much about what these patterns look like down the road. Below that, you have two sessions. Uh, uh, reassign DOIs and assign DOIs. Reassign DOIs is really kind of a dangerous option, uh, and I wouldn't recommend clicking it uh, if you have at any point registered DOIs with any agency like Crossref or Datasite or whomever. Um, if you've done that, don't click reassign DOIs. What it does is it removes all DOI suffixes from existing articles uh, and then replaces them with whatever you've determined uh, in your DOI suffix section. So it can be really handy if you say assign all your DOIs to your full publication history all at once, and then you notice, oh, uh, I had volume here, um, but my journal doesn't use volumes, it uses issues. And so you have a bunch of zeroed out volumes or, or something along those lines. You can remove them all and redo them. Um, so do avoid clicking reassign DOIs unless you really want to remove all existing DOIs and put different ones in. And then the assign DOIs button is very straightforward. All it does is assign a DOI to anything that's published that does not currently have one. Uh, so again, the first time you're doing um, maybe all of your DOIs, let's say you just got a membership and you want to assign DOIs and register them all all at once, clicking this button will assign a DOI to anything you've already published. So it's very handy. And that's really it for the DOI settings.
So I'm going to move on to the Crossref settings. You can find the Crossref plugin in this main plugin gallery, but the way you're probably going to get to it the most often is over on the left-hand sidebar underneath Tools. So we'll click on Tools, and then we're going to click on Crossref XML Export Plugin. So this is the basic uh, page for settings for the Crossref XML Export Plugin. It's very straightforward. There's a quick link to the DOI plugin if you need to make any quick changes. Uh, below that is the uh, information required for depositing to Crossref, which includes a depositor name and a depositor email. Uh, and then below that, you have the credentials you would have been assigned by Crossref uh, when you originally got your membership. So you have a username, and they'll tell you what your username will be, and they'll have a password. Uh, and depending on when you signed up with Crossref, you will either accept that password yourself, or they will have given it to you. So those are all required. Uh, below that is an option for OJS to automatically deposit your DOIs to Crossref when you publish. Uh, this happens on what's known as a cron job. Um, so if uh, every night, say, uh, maybe 11 p.m. Or, or 12 a.m., it will push all of your uh, DOIs that were uh, flagged to be sent that day to Crossref. So it doesn't happen right away. Uh, it sometimes takes a little while after publishing for that to happen. I do recommend everybody turn this on uh, on a production workflow. So ideally, you'll have to think about your DOIs very little. Uh, that's kind of the way you want it. The next option here is to use the Crossref test API. This is really only for testing, and you need specific credentials to test. So I would not recommend using the Crossref test API for really any reason. So actually, what you'll probably want to see is something a little bit more like this would be more standard. Automatic assignment and on the regular API. For the purpose of my testing, I do kind of have to do this, uh, and you'll see why. So I'm going to click Save. You'll see up here my changes have been saved. So we'll hop over to the article uh, uh, section itself. So right here, what we see is all of the DOIs uh, for content that's been published that has yet to be deposited. I can see the little not deposited status on the right hand side here. At the top, I have a search function. Um, so I can search for specific article titles or authors if I want. That's probably not super common. Um, but below that, I can search for specific issues. And it will filter out based on the issue I want to publish in. And I can also filter out by status. So if I want to look at all the content that's not deposited or all the stuff that's failed, for example, um, I can just search for and get that content back. Below that, we have the actual DOIs and articles themselves. So we have a little select button that we'll need to select in order to deposit, export, or mark active. And I'll get to that in a second. We have the article ID. Every ID uh, or every article in OJS has a unique identifier. Uh, and this is the one for this particular article. And you'll see the same number is actually in the DOI suffix itself. It's part of the suffix that we've generated. Uh, we can see the author and title, the issue that that article is in, and then the DOI that we're going to have when we publish and the status. Uh, and that exists for all of the articles that we've shown here. If I click on the title, I go to the publication workflow of that article. And if I click on the issue, I will be able to view the issue in which it was published. Below this, we have uh, a checkbox for validating the XML. Um, so when you're doing um, your registration, say, by hand, uh, so if I was going to register all of these right now, and I clicked Validate XML, and I clicked Deposit, the first thing the plugin would do would be to check to make sure that the XML that's being deposited to Crossref is valid. Uh, the downside to this is that um, it's kind of slow. So if you're doing maybe 15 or 20 of these at once, uh, it's going to really slow down the process if you have Validate XML. But it's great if you only have a handful and you can kind of get an error before you would normally get a failed deposit. Uh, so it's just a nice way to check your work while you're depositing. Below that is an option for only validating the export, but not downloading the file. This is a quick way to sort of check to see if your XML is valid in general. Um, if this is checked and you click all these and you click export, it will tell you whether or not your XML is valid, and that's it. Um, so below that, we have these three buttons, deposit, export, and mark active. Deposit is straightforward. If I click one of these and I click deposit, it's going to send the deposit to Crossref. Uh, I got a little error up here uh, because my test journal is not currently functional that I'm working with. You'll see my status updated here to failed. Um, and I got that error. So a deposit sends that content to Crossref or tries to send that content to Crossref. 
the export button downloads that XML. So if I click the export button, it's going to ask me if I want to save the content, uh, and then I can download it and I can review it. And if I want to just go this route, I can log into doi.crossref.org and upload my XML from there, and I don't have to use this part of the registration workflow at all. The next option here is Mark Active. The way Mark Active works is if I highlight these two, for example, and I click Mark Active, it will show up here as Mark Active. Um, the use case is that if I uploaded the XML in another place, uh, but I wanted to indicate here that I had deposited those DOIs, Marked Active indicates that I've deposited those DOIs elsewhere, uh, and then I, I don't need to worry about registering them here. So that's really all there is to the plugin. As you go through, you can click article by article and deposit. Again, I got a failure because I'm not in an actual production environment, uh, but that's how you would do the work. And then the one thing I want to show you on top of this is where the DOI actually gets assigned in the publication workflow. So in order to see that, it's actually part of the way submissions work in OJS. So I'll show you by clicking on this specific title what a publication workflow looks like in OJS. I can see that this version has been published, um, but that's okay. I can just unpublish it quickly, not a big deal. So uh, let's say this is an article I'm about to publish. Uh, if I go to issue, I can see which issue I'm going to publish it in. I know it's gonna go in volume number one, number three. I can see that it's gonna go under articles. Um, I can put page numbers in here. Here's the publication date. Uh, I can check the metadata to make sure all of our metadata is set. So we have title and abstract, we have contributors, all of the names of the people who have contributed content. And then the next section is identifiers. So under identifiers, I can see what the DOI that's assigned will be. If I don't like it for some reason, I can clear it, uh, and then I can just as easily assign it. The number is the same um, because it's based on the article ID, which is, again, unique, uh, and then the volume and the issue in this particular suffix pattern. So I save this, and then I click on Schedule for Publication. It tells me what the DOI is going to be before I publish, which is good. I get a good indication so that I know this DOI is going to be attached to my publication, and I hit Publish. And that's really all there is to it. So you assign the identifier in your uh, submission publication workflow. You hop over to the Crossref plugin itself. Uh, if you have automatic submissions turned on, uh, then you probably don't need to worry too much about it. Maybe wait 12 hours or so and then check to see if your DOI is registering. Sometimes it takes some time, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and then if you don't want to wait, you can click on all the ones you want to deposit, click the deposit button, and then they will be deposited and you'll get a status back. If you do get a failure, you should be able to click on the failure and you'll get the error specifically. Here you can see it's because of our ISSN. This is just related to the testing environment we're in, um, but you'll be able to get a specific error that you can ideally give either back to uh, your service provider or to Crossref support, and they should be able to help you with your issue. So that's really all there is to it. Um, that's the basics of configuring your DOI and configuring your Crossref plugins. Um, as always, if there are any questions, you can reach out to Crossref support or you can reach us on the PKP support forum and we'll do our best to help you out. Um, thanks so much and uh, good luck. Okay. I hope everyone was able to see that okay. Um, let me just try to now close the YouTube. Is uh, it's a little bit plain. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, I hope that was easy enough to understand. I know that Mike speaks quite fast, um, but don't worry, we will be sharing um, the link to this as well. So if you want to review it again, then you will be able to. Um, I'm also aware that we are uh, running out of time, so I will try not to take up too much time with the rest of the presentation. Um, if people are happy to stay on a little bit longer, then that would be great and we'll answer some more questions uh, and we're happy to just hang about a little bit, um, a few more minutes as well to, to make sure that we answer all the questions. Okay, so um, just to uh, add on to what Mike was saying. Um, as we said, many of our members publish, a, uh, publish using the Open Journal Systems uh, platform. I know that many of you will be using OJS, and so you're probably very familiar with the tool already. Um, on the screen here, you can find a list of the different um, versions of OJS and what they provide support for. So we do recommend, and PKP recommends, that you at least update to OJS 3.1.2. 
Um, and in addition to content registration, which um, is available on that plugin, there are plugins for support to uh, reference linking, similarity check, the funder registry. And these different um, supports vary by version, which is why it's good to make sure that you're up to date. PKP is continually working with Crossref to improve the level of um, overall DOI export support provided within OJS. And we're working with them to provide a plugin for our cited by service as well as Crossmark. And they should be ready quite soon. Uh, so look out for announcements about those in the coming months. Um, and we'll make sure that we talk about those on our forum as well. Whatever method of registration you use, it's really important um, that your metadata be accurate, complete and up to date. Accurate because the information needs to be the right information. Misspelled author names or bad license URLs or bad DOI URLs can be really problematic. Complete because the more information you provide about your content, the more discoverable and more reusable it will be. For example, don't just include the name of the first author, but make sure that you include uh, names of all the authors, include an ORCID identifier where you can, um, make sure you include licenses, funder information where you have it. And it's also important that you keep your metadata up to date um, with any changes. So for example, if your content moves to a new site, you need to make sure that you update the URL with us so that your DOI continues to take readers to the correct location. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to update and add extra metadata to your existing DOI um, deposits at Crossref. So as we were saying, after registering your content, it's really important that you also maintain your metadata and make sure it's kept up to date. Sometimes there are errors, this happens, so these need to be corrected, or it might be that there's additional information that should be included at a later date. It's important that your readers can always find and use the content that you publish, so you need to ensure that you update your URLs if your content moves to a new location, so that your DOI link still functions correctly. Incorrect or outdated metadata um, is not helpful for researchers. Um, it won't help them to find the content and that's essentially what you want them to be able to do. So when people look for your content, um, as I think Mr. Uh, Despato was saying earlier, uh, people search not just by the DOI, but also by a variety of the metadata. So this might be the author name, the ORCID identifier, uh, they might search by a title or even a date. So it's really helpful for all authors, um, oh, sorry, it's really helpful for um, everyone if you include as much metadata as possible so that people can discover your content. So if there is an error, or an update that you need to make in the metadata, it's necessary to send us the updated metadata. And I'll talk about how to do this uh, momentarily. If you only need to change the URL, for example, if your website has changed and the location of your content has moved, you can send us a CSV file to our support team at support at crossref.org. And in the CSV file, you should include all the DOIs that you need to update and their new URLs. Our technical team can then update the records for you so that you don't have to do this for each one individually. Please note that you do not need to assign a new DOI um, for a URL update or for a title transfer, and that there are never any, uh, never any charges to update your metadata. This is always free. So to correct or update metadata for a content item that you have already registered with us. You can do this in a variety of different ways, depending on what content registration method you are comfortable with using. So if you use OJS, um, you can um, update this and redeposit it, um, and it will update in our system. So you find the record that you wish to update, uh, you leave the relevant field blank if you want to delete it, or you add in your new metadata to update it, and then you deposit this again using the Crossref import export plugin. You have to be using at least cross, uh, OJS 3.1.2 and have this Crossref import export plugin enabled in order to do this. If you're using the web deposit form, you can use that to make these changes as well. 
but please note that you'll need to redeposit all of the metadata that you sent before. So for example, if you found that you misspelled an author's name, you need to manually type or copy and paste not just the corrected last name, but also all the journal level, issue, num uh, issue level and article level metadata that applies to the article before you resubmit it. Similarly, if you're using XML, you should redeposit an, a new XML file with, us, with the updated metadata. And when making this update, you must supply all the bibliographic metadata for the record being updated, not just the fields that need to be changed. So during this update process, we overwrite your existing metadata with the new information. So if you leave anything blank, then this will then be missing um, from your deposit. And please note as well, if you're using XML, that you need to include um, a timestamp element. And this might uh, this needs to be incremented each time a DOI is updated. Otherwise, uh, this will come back as a failure. Um, and as I said, for URL updates, you don't need to resubmit all the metadata. You can simply send us a CSV file, and we'll update that for you. So a bit of a note on transferring content to a different publisher. I know this question came up yesterday. Um, so the publishers of a journal can change. Um, if the content is transferred to another publisher, you do not need to change the assigned DOI or the prefix. You only need to change the metadata. So for example, the URL. The new publisher is then responsible for maintaining that content and for registering new content. They can use their own prefix for the new content that they post, or they can use uh, your existing prefix. However, and the new publisher must be a Crossref member if they want to register content with us. Um, and our technical team can help you if you have questions about this, um, just send us an email to our support or uh, contact us in the community forum. And on that note, I'm just going to provide some links to where you can go for more support and find out some more information about all of this. So you can visit our community forum. Here you can ask questions uh, either in English or Bahasa or another language if you wish. Um, and then these questions will be answered either by the Crossref team, our ambassadors or other community members. You can check out our education documentation, which has detailed how-to guides. Um, again, this is only available in English at the moment, but hopefully might be in other languages in future. You can email our support team or our member team or our billing team, depending on what type of question that you have. And we also run webinars, obviously, such as this one on a variety of different uh, tools and services. You can also find all of our uh, previous webinar recordings on that page as well. We do have some, uh, I believe, in Indonesian on that page. You can also follow us on Twitter, read our blog um, and sign up to our newsletter to sign up to date. Uh, with any new developments that were are coming up and uh, that's all i'm going to say for today um i'm going to just put this slide up as well to just highlight what's coming up tomorrow um so tomorrow we've got a talk by uh dr mohammed uh bando um and then we also are following this with a talk about um, the value of cross drive mess data and we're going to highlight some more examples um, of how that's used in the community Okay, so thank you very much. I'm going to see if there's more questions before we close for today. Okay, thank you, Vanessa, Amanda, and also Paul, uh, answering also the questions already. There are several questions already answered. And there is no one here raising their hands, but I've already put some information for tomorrow also. Uh, I put the link. Uh, for registration for tomorrow uh, will be our last webinar series with Crossref. And uh, Bapak Ibu, uh, kita membahas uh, metadata untuk besok. Uh, dan besok yang akan hadir adalah Kepala Perpustakaan Nasional. Uh, Kepala Perpustakaan Nasional Indonesia, Bapak Muhammad Syarif Bando. Bapak Ibu, besok bisa mengikuti diskusi seperti hari ini ya. Jadi diawali dengan presentasi dari Bapak Syarif Bandu besok selama 45 menit dan tanya jawab sekitar satu jam. Kemudian akan dilanjutkan dengan Vanessa and also 
other cross staff stuff for tomorrow. Uh, I think that would be Vanessa and Jenny. Siapa lagi? Uh, with uh, who are who are they? I forgot the posters. I need to check my posters here. <laughs> yes. Uh, for tomorrow, it also will be uh, Paul and Jenny, right? Yes. Uh, Jeannie is cross staff director of members and community, and Paul will be there too tomorrow, right, Paul? Right, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I think it's already four o'clock here in the afternoon. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, for explaining about metadata and how to register and how to upload and everything there. Uh, for the link, nanti Bapak Ibu akan juga menerima di email. Setelah acara ini selesai, akan ada email yang memuat materi hari ini. Right? Oke, okay, uh, dengan demikian saya akhiri acara hari ini. Terima kasih atas perhatian Bapak Ibu hari ini. Jangan lupa untuk registrasi untuk acara besok. Saya mohon maaf jika ada salah sebagai moderator hari ini. Terima kasih. Pak Asar, Pak Tansil, yeah, thank, thank you Amanda, Vanessa, Amanda, Vanessa Paul, uh, dan, Tanzil, dan juga Pak Dasar sudah sudah pergi duluan tadi jika uh, ada meeting tadi. Terima kasih, thank you very much for having Bye -bye. me here also. Thank you everyone. Ya, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya, sama-sama Vanessa.